Hi, welcome. I'm glad you're joining me today where I'm going to be talking about this foundational principle throughout the Bible. It's profuse, very much so, in the Old Testament. And I want to explain how the reality of it is revealed in the New Testament, and that is the foundation of atonement, or it's otherwise known as propitiation. And it, I really think this is necessary, of course, because it's, it is literally foundational. But also, I've noticed in grace circles, and I am in that circle, that grace is can have a difficult time being appreciated when we don't know the impact that the blood of Jesus Christ does for us. You know, if you don't know what has been paid for, you won't appreciate what you got. And grace, the gospel of grace, is such a rich message. And, however, it's it won't be received as thankfully if we don't know the extent to what it is accomplishing for us here in the new covenant under grace in, in and by and through Jesus Christ. So I, I want to talk about this and essentially propitiation or atonement means pleasing sacrifice. It's the sacrifice that literally pleased our Heavenly Father that put away all sin from us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'll be getting that into that more in the second part. But today, and just hang tight, because before we can get to the good stuff, we have to cover the bad stuff. <laughs> you know, I can't just jump to square number two without covering the first base. So, let me just first say that God is a just God. God doesn't just sweep our sins under the carpet, so to say, and say, oh, well, I forgive you. Go on about your way, and we just think the sins are still around somewhere. But our conscience isn't purified by knowing that our sins haven't been swept away, but they've been paid for because God is a just God. He's fair. He's not just going to overlook something. Now, he did that many times in the Old Testament where he, because of it, it says, because of his forbearance, because of his patience with the people, knowing that they were just but a wisp and a vapor. You know, their flesh had no strength in and of itself to stand against sin. So many times he just put people, the judgment for people's sins on credit, so to say. And that credit card was paid up in Jesus Christ. And we'll be talking about that more. I'm kind of jumping ahead there. But let's just talk about first that God is just. He's fair. He doesn't overlook um, he doesn't overlook thievery or robbery or death and destruction and just say, oh, well, I'm sorry about that. Too bad. <laughs> no. He, he, is, he likes to have the scales even. You know, he is just. He is fair. And even in Romans 12, 19, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. But give place to wrath, no, or I'm sorry, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So while we live in this world, when things just don't always go fairly, don't worry, just roll those cares over unto God, and know that there will be um, a, a recompense for those things 
at the end. There will be, as it even says in Revelation 6, verse 9 and 10, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So it is his will. He will make the books even, so to say. God is just. Let's not forget that. And, and I really, I almost really don't have to say that, but because so many people are still somewhat law-minded. I mean, they... I think in most cases people do even overemphasize God's judgment. So I'm really saying this uh, for the point of those who actually go way overboard into the the grace ditch, so to say, and 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 they think, well, you know, anything goes. You know, our sins are covered, so hey, let's just sin some more. Let's let it all hang out. Who cares? You know, there's just no appreciation for what the grace of God can, how it works in our life. It's, it's to lead us, as it says in Titus 2, 11 and 12, he, it leads us to godliness. It teaches us godliness, not lawlessness. So, it's really a so-called abuse of the word grace when people just use it as uh, an occasion to let their flesh do whatever they want to do. Because when you truly do know grace, it really causes you to love people even more. That's the true influence of grace. But when people like to you, they, when people use it as an excuse, then they really, really don't have the revelation of grace. They just kind of sort of heard about it, and they're just using it as a, a, you know, a card to throw out there and say, oh, well, I have grace, so I can do this. You know, we, we are forgiven, and I'm really taking a bunny trail here, but we are freely forgiven and I stand firmly by that and the more we realize that the more the influence of grace will have upon our lives to live a godly life right and also even it says in Galatians 6 verse 6 and 7 do not be deceived God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that will he also reap for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And I like to paraphrase that and say, there's no way for you to bootleg eternal life. You know, here it's talking about when you sow to the Spirit, in other words, when you are just grace and gospel minded, you will reap the benefits of eternal life here in this world. You don't wait for eternal life up in heaven sometime. No, we can enjoy eternal life right now as we keep our mind fixed upon Jesus and all that he's accomplished for us. But when it says there that when we sow to our flesh, that's talking about sowing to being law-minded. Because really being law-minded is, is when sin comes alive. It sees an opportunity, as it says in Romans 7, and it takes it, it sees an occasion to be empowered in your life, and consequently, you reap corruption in your life. And don't get, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you reap, uh, you know, destruction or or death and sickness when you're in sin 
You know, no, that's not what that says. In context, in the book of Galatians, it's talking about being law-minded. So that's sowing to the flesh. And the more you are law-minded, the more you, you have less confidence toward God, and the less, therefore, you are able to receive these freely given promises and blessings that we have all due to Christ. You know, it all comes through your conscience. If your conscience is corrupted, if it's uh, condemned, if you feel guilty because, because you have been law-minded, you'll have difficult time receiving boldly from the throne of grace, from the throne of his free, unmerited favors. And you'll therefore experience corruption or the consequences of being law-minded in your life. So God is saying, in a sense, he's saying justly, you know, if you're going to be law-minded, well then expect to receive according to the law. But if you're going to be grace-minded, well then expect to see fruit of righteousness and and eternal life spring up in your life. That is your just reward, so to say. You will experience abundant life as you are gospel-minded. And that's, God is just in saying that. Right? Amen. And then also, even in 1 Thessalonians 4, Verse 4, it says that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. And we also forewarned you and testified. So, God is just and he avenges this certain sin. You know, it's talking about being um, sexually immoral with your brother, you know, uh, not being holy, acting in that regard, and he will justly avenge that sin. You know, you can't expect to, yeah, I think it says in Hebrews 13 4 that the marriage bed is to be held in honor and remain undefiled and God certainly judges the adulterer. You know, I mean, there's these verses even in the New Testament that says that God holds people accountable for the way they are, uh, the, according to the way they are living. If you're sowing to the flesh, you reap corruption. If you're sowing to the Spirit, you reap eternal life. And that's how God, quote-unquote, avenges these sins, right? But my whole point in saying all those lovely verses <laughs> is to especially emphasize that God is just, right? He is not just willy-nilly, oh, well, that's okay. No, he is black as black and white as white to God, and there's no in-between. And he definitely, you know, and I'm not talking in, t in context of mercy right now. I'm just talking about the fact when, when we're talking about judgment, there is just rewards for living according to the Spirit versus living according to the flesh, as we've definitely nailed it down here in these verses I've said. And just as an example, you know, this tends to help when we give a real life example. Let's just say, you know, we, wherever you're living, I'm sure you've got some kind of court system. And let's just say that the judge is overseeing a case where somebody, a rapist, let's say, comes into court and all the proof is there. He has absolutely, surely been proven of raping somebody. And would you consider it fair 
for the judge to say, well, I see you have all this evidence against you, but that's okay. Go on, go ahead, be on your way. No punishment for that. No, you, especially if you were part of the family of that person or that person that was, um, you know, uh, transgressed upon, to say the least, you would not be happy with that judgment. You would say, what, are we, what kind of nation are we living in? Is this a terrorist takeover here? I mean, let's see some just judgment here. I mean, even in our own cells, we have this, uh, uh, what's the word, a scale. I mean, we, we, we know when something's just not right, or usually you do. <laughs> but that, a lot of times that's what the word's for, to show us that, to bring enlightenment, that no, this is right and that's wrong. So maybe you don't know what's right and wrong. That's what the word's for. But we do know, as an example, in that case, that would be concern. That would be considered crooked, unjust, totally unfair, not acceptable in the least. That kind of judgment, right? Well, how can we expect that God would not even be better a judge than that concerning all matters? You know, He is the judge of the universe, right? God is fair. And I definitely want to mention this, that he's not at, let's, let's kind of look at it from the gla glasses half full, not half empty. You know, when God is judging, it's not because of Jesus, which I'll be getting to later. It's not because he's mad and wants to take out punishment on the person that that did that sin. No, he is defending the victim. That's the emphasis. Is It's unfair for the victim to not receive a just recompense for the transgression that was done upon them, right? So God defends the widows and the orphans as it says in the Bible. You know, he defends the weak. And that is how we should see judgment. You know, God's judgment. It shouldn't be, oh well God's just out to get you and he's you know, he, he has you know, like a you know, this picture of an angry God who has a lightning bolt and he can't wait to wipe out somebody. <laughs> no. You know, our God is a good, good God. His compassion is long, and He bears long with us. You know, He is He is not quick to judge. You know, as it says, He is slow to anger. That is, His nature is not to quickly punish people. He is out to defend and rescue those who have been downtrodden and put low, you know, that's his his focus is to lift up the lowly. Amen. And that's the context we should really understand God being a just judge. I mean, even in Luke 18, that's the example given of a widow who went to an unjust judge and Jesus told that parable and he said, "Will not God the just judge avenge us who cry out to him, will he not avenge them speedily? You know, God is out to support those who have been transgressed and, and shortchanged. He is out to defend the, the weak, right? And that's how we should see God judging people. That's that's especially, especially now here in the New Testament, that is how we see God judging. He's not out to immediately give you the penalties for your sin. No, 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 no. And hang tight, because I will be getting to that. That's the good part. <laughs> we'll be talking about the effect of Jesus' blood. We are no longer under the old covenant. 
So uh, as I'm s emphasizing here that there is penalty for sin because God is just. And as it says here in Psalm 78, 37, their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet he being compassionate, note that, he's compassionate. He atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. So you can see here in the Old Covenant that there was a war on sin. And yet many times God had compassion upon people, mercy. But there was a just penalty for sin that needed to be made, which of course, is what happened with Jesus. Again, in Hosea 9, verse 9, it says, They have d deeply corrupted themselves, as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their guilt. He will punish their sins. So it's a just thing that sins be punished. You know, we can't overlook this. We can't just say, oh, well, your sins, they just... They're just put away. They're just forgotten. No, they were judged. And I'm not getting to that point yet. I just want to emphasize the fact that in, when sin came into the world through Adam, it needed to be judged. But it wasn't accounted for until the law was given. But sin was in the world. Even after Adam, of course, after Adam sinned. And God withheld his judgment many times because the law hadn't even yet been given. You know, e even in, of course, Genesis, when Cain, the first murderer, sinned, when he killed his brother, did God wipe Cain out immediately? No, he actually had compassion. Believe it or not, he had compassion upon Cain and he protected him from being killed himself. You don't normally do that for a murderer. <laughs> so that's an example of God's great compassion for the sinner. He doesn't rush out to judge people. No, he saved all judgment for a certain person at a certain time. And his name is Jesus. And Isaiah 59, verse 2, it says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. So again, you know, we had this war going on between us and God because of sins. There was not, there wasn't peace between God and man. Sin had to be paid for. It had to be uh, redeemed so that God and I, God, we and God can be reconciled again. You know, as it said right there, your iniquities have separated you from God. Right? So let's get to the good news. <laughs> Let's go to Lamentations 4.22. Lamentations 4.22 says, The punishment of your iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no longer send you into captivity. He will punish your iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will uncover your sins. But there in the very beginning there, where it's talking about Zion, that's a shadow of the church. And we can see right there, prophesy, that He will atone for our sins. They will be punished and that will be it. Taken care of. Done away with. Amen? That's beautiful. And then, actually, the, I think the, one of the most beautiful sections of Scripture 
talking about Jesus, a shadow of Jesus, prophesying of Jesus is Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5. And this is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It says, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. The punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Isn't that beautiful? So there is our payment for our sins, as many of you already know. But it, and it took us a bit to get to this point, but we can see because God is just and the sins that we had done had separated us from God that Jesus came because he loved us so much. He came and he stood in our place and took away the punishment for our sins. He took away our sins. He took away the law, as it says in Colossians 2.14. You know, all these things that stood against us and opposed us, he was so happy to remove away from us. That's what forgiven means, forgiveness. It means to take away. So he took away our sins. He carried those himself on the cross. Praise God that, that he was crushed and punished for our iniquity so that we can be at peace again, not only with our Heavenly Father, but, but peace means nothing broken, nothing lacking, wholeness. He paid an awesome price to make us whole again, to give us eternal life. That was his goal, was to not just take away our sins, but to give us eternal life, to give us his righteousness. As it says in verses 10 and 11, yet it pleased the Lord, or you could say he was satisfied, it, it pleased him to bruise him. He has put him to grief, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. God the Father was satisfied forever with Jesus' work alone on our behalf on the cross. So we don't have to try and merit and earn God's pleasure and say, Oh God, please forgive me for this sin and for that sin. And But now, knowing how much, and that's why it took so long to get to this point, is by knowing how much your sins separated you from God, you can now appreciate what Jesus has done for us in reconciling us back to God. Because without him, we would still experience this separation. There would still be a war, so to say, between us and God that needed to be settled. You know, this, this war just had to be appeased, right? And it was all done through Jesus' blood, through his work on the cross. And it says here that that when God was satisfied with the labor of his soul, in verse 11, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So he carried all our sin to the cross. And, he, and therefore, and in that, he justified us all. He gave us all the gift of righteousness through his work. And now, knowing that God's judgment upon sin has been accomplished, we are now made in right standing with God freely through Jesus' work. And this is the crux of atonement, that Christianese word that people 
don't really know about too much because it's more often spoken of in the Old Testament. But it literally means pleasing sacrifice. It was Jesus' sacrifice that, as it says here in these verses, satisfied the Lord forever because it accomplished his main goal, which was to give us righteousness, to make us in right standing with the Father. You know, God's will was never for us to perish, to be judged for our sins. It's never his will. That, that's not his goal. It's the complete opposite. He wants us to receive his righteousness and his abundant life. And that comes through us trusting in what Jesus has accomplished for us and, and acknowledging that he was the propitiation, that fancy word that also means pleasing sacrifice, right? He has justified us freely by his grace. Amen? So now we can really, knowing what he accomplished, we can really appreciate what he's done. You know, it's so it's beneficial to know square one, that we were all fallen away from the Lord, and there's no not one righteous, not one, as it says in Romans 3. You know, our, all our, even our righteousnesses, not sins, but our righteousnesses were as filthy rags to God, as it says in Isaiah 64, 6. You know, we needed an intercessor. We needed a mediator. We needed a, a champion, a savior who would come on our behalf, who was who was an acceptable sacrifice to stand in our place. And none of us were acceptable because we all were sinners. We needed somebody perfect to, to buy that. It was, Jesus was acceptable. He was perfect. He is perfect. And he carried, because of that, when he did carry our sins, being perfect in himself, that made him a perfect sacrifice to save us from our sins. Amen? And as it says here in Isaiah 40, this is beautiful, Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So you could see here that the war between God and us due to our sins has been, and it's ended. It's atoned for, it's paid for because of the pleasing sacrifice of Jesus. And that's why it's, you know, it was hard for me at first to talk about all these Old Testament scriptures about sin, judging, being judged and separating you from God. Because now, after Jesus has come, the only ministry that God equips ministers to share and be anointed to share is the ministry of reconciliation as it says in 2 Corinthians 5. So it's quite a, it really is a challenge <laughs> for me to talk about sin and how your sins have separated you from God and God is a just God, you know, because it's, it's almost, it's, you know, like an Old Testament mentality to cover that ground with you. But now, I can just say, as it says here, that you are to know his comfort because sin has been judged. You know, some ministers, they're still in the old mentality saying, sin's got to be judged. Sin's got to be judged. Well, sin has been judged. It was all done in Jesus. And now our warfare is over. We are in right standing, given the gift 
a right standing with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. Our iniquity has been per pardoned through the blood of Jesus Christ. And even as it says here in verse 2, this is powerful, that Jesus himself must have paid at least double for our sins in his death, which is very believable. You know, he didn't just cover it to the penny. No, he went over and above what was needed to be paid for. As it says there, double for our sins has been paid for. So you shouldn't feel the least bit hesitant to come boldly to the throne of grace, asking for grace and mercy and help in your time of need. You know, that's why the blood of Jesus Christ is so powerful, is knowing that, that he has purged away our sins forever. That we have forgiveness of sins through the, through the blood of Jesus Christ, according to the abundant riches of his grace. You know, not, you haven't earned a bit to be in right standing with your Heavenly Father. It's all through His blood and His grace. So don't think you have to do spiritual calisthenics. You know, be busy about spiritual things, but yet you're going nowhere. You know, you're, all your spiritual exercises don't earn you uh, any inkling better position before God than what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for you. Amen. So from the quote unquote least saint to the quote unquote greatest saint, because don't you know, actually, we're all of equal standing before the throne of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's no greater saint and less saint like some religion teaches. Now you have just as great standing before the Father as Jesus does. You know, let's not even bring to mind Apostle Paul or Apostle John or, you know, any of these super dupers that we read in the Bible. Let's just say Jesus. Hello. He's the greatest. Jesus said, I've made you a joint heir of his inheritance. So you have just as much rightful standing before the Father based on what Jesus has done as Jesus. Because you're a joint heir with him. And he doesn't, you know, have you slightly below him. No, he, he calls you his brother, his sister, his mother. You know, because you've trusted in him and his work. And now, therefore, you can expect that as soon as you say, Father, He hears you. He answers your prayers. He's quick to listen. Amen? So, I just so enjoy talking about this and explaining what atonement or propitiation is all about here in the New Testament. Seen in the eyes of the finished work of Jesus. And, you know, we will continue this again next time. I have another lesson. You know, I want to continue speaking on this about how Jesus is our high priest as the type and shadow goes in the Old Testament. So we'll be talking some more next time about this. And thanks for joining me this time. And I look forward to sharing with you some more again. Have a great week. God bless you. Bye-bye.